1972, an artist by the name of Larry Norman released a song that really changed the landscape of Christian music, really changed what people thought Christian music could or potentially even should sound like. He wrote a song called, Why Should the Devil Have All the Good Music? Perhaps you are uh, familiar with this song, and, and many, many people say that this song and, and this artist, Larry Norman, was influential in their own careers in Christian rock and roll. He was extremely instrumental. Now, I, I tend to be more of a follower of the great philosopher Hank Hill, who said that this kind of music generally does not make Christianity better, it only makes rock and roll worse. But we can discuss the merits of Christian rock at a different time. But, but the point of bringing up Larry Norman is perhaps one of his more famous songs is one on which he comments on our passage today. This, these words of Jesus, these ominous words of Jesus in many ways, Larry Norman writes this, life was filled with guns and war, and everyone got trampled on the floor. I wish we'd all been ready. Children died, the days grew cold, a piece of bread could buy a bag of gold. I wish we'd all been ready. There's no time to change your mind. The sun has come, and you've been left behind. Now, I disagree with some of Norman's conclusions about how the end will take place and some of his conclusions about this passage, particularly using this phrase, left behind, which interestingly enough went on to inspire uh, a, a series of books by Tim LaHaye of the same title. And though I would quibble with some of Norman's thoughts there, I do think he captures something in this song captures something about these words from our Savior, that this passage brings about some level of introspection, some level of self-analysis, causing us to ask questions like, are we ready? Or to use the words of Christ Himself, are we awake? And if this question and the thought of Christ returning concerns us at all, then it leads us to the obvious follow-up. What does it mean to be awake? What is it that Jesus is calling us to in this passage? Well, the history of the church has spent these times leading up to Christmas, this Advent season, considering questions like this. And as you've noticed in the liturgy this morning, we've made some shifts as far as some of our focus, and we'll do so over the next few weeks as we consider Advent, a season that in our culture doesn't get a whole lot of attention. We're more Christmas people. Thanksgiving happens on Thursday. Christmas starts on Friday. And that's often how we think in our culture. However, what we're going to do over the coming weeks is delay for a moment the singing of joy to the world, and instead spend some time singing O Come, O Come, Emmanuel, Ransom Captive Israel, taking some time to consider that the reality that we know in this world is not as it should be, and asking ourselves what exactly is the hope of Christ's coming? And what does it mean to be prepared for it? And these are some things that we'll be considering over the coming weeks, and particularly considering from this passage in Matthew 24 this morning as Jesus speaks about His coming and how unexpected it will be. And I want to consider that first this morning as we walk through this passage, Christ's unexpected return. Well, it might seem strange to begin this season leading up to Advent with such an apocalyptic text, but that's exactly what the history of the church has often done, so we will do that as well here. And here we find this passage nested in a much longer section of Jesus first rebuking the religious leaders of His day, which transitions into Jesus telling about the destruction of the center of their religious lives the very temple. 
And of course, this does come true in, in AD 70 as the temple is destroyed. But as Jesus is talking about this, his disciples have some questions. When will this be? When will this destruction of the temple be? When will your coming be? And it would seem that the disciples, along with many of the Jews of the day, assumed that the destruction of the temple would coincide with the end of the world. That's what made sense in their mind. But, but Jesus explains differently that the end of the temple and the signs that go along with it will be clear to see. But they do not coincide, at least in a strictly chronological sense, with the second coming, with the end of the age, because that time will not come with clarity at all. In fact, it will come like a thief in the night. No one will expect it. And that's where Jesus starts with our text this morning in verse 36. But concerning that day, that hour, the day of his return, not even the angels of heaven nor the Son, but the Father only knows when this will be. Jesus here speaking of this great day of the Lord, this day when he will return finally, when he will usher in the world to come. And Jesus, in painting this picture for his disciples, gives three vignettes to explain the nature of this return, specifically that it will come at a time that is unexpected. And he begins by returning to the Old Testament, to the days of Noah. Now, often when we come across the days of Noah in the New Testament, we see the New Testament authors showing the flood as a transition period between two worlds, the world that was and the world that is now. And especially as Peter describes this, he uses this as a picture to say what will happen in the end. There is a world now, but that world will end like the days of Noah, like the flood. A cataclysmic event will come and bring about a completely new reality. Well, Peter gets this from Jesus himself. As Jesus uses this image of a great cataclysmic event that will bring about this new world. But, but Jesus here is not as focused on the cataclysmic nature of the end time, but the reality that it will come when no one expects it. Just as no one expected the flood in the days of Noah, save Noah and his family, so will be his second coming. And once it comes, just like the flood, it will be too late for those who are unaware. Those prepared will be saved, but those not, those found sleeping, will be caught up in the judgment. And we'll return to that in just a moment. Well, Jesus continues this by bringing another vignette in, in a similar way that the Larry Norman song does, that two men will be in a field, and just like the flood, out of nowhere, one will be swept away and one left behind. Two men grinding at, or two women rather, grinding at the mill, going about their normal everyday business. All of a sudden, one is taken away and one is left behind. I can recall growing up and hearing this passage taught, and it was taught in a way that, you know, you'd be walking to school one day, and, and on the sidewalk, you'd see a pile of clothes and a backpack, and, and one of your friends had apparently been taken up um, in, in the rapture, and, and that was always a, a strange uh, a vision in, in my mind, but it's interesting here that, that Jesus actually doesn't indicate whether it's better to be taken up or left behind. The Greek terms used here are very flexible. Um, they, they don't necessarily have any negative or positive connotations, this word for taken or left behind, but I do think it is interesting that if we see this vignette consistently with how Jesus spoke of the days of Noah, being swept up was not what you wanted. Noah and his family were saved by being left behind. 
interesting thing here. All that to say, you can consider that later, but all that to say, I wouldn't load too much on those terms. Jesus isn't giving a thorough theology or picture of how things will go down, but rather a picture of the unexpected nature of His return. The final portrait that Christ paints is even more explicit in its wording, perhaps more relatable to us, that Christ will come like a home invader. If you thought much or read much about home invasions, this, this, this imagery is kind of troubling. I mean, I can't think of much scarier as a father to, for someone to come into your home in the middle of the night while you're sleeping. It seems like an interesting way to describe our Lord and Savior's return, and yet Jesus Himself describes it this way. In fact, the New Testament authors will continue to talk about Jesus' return in this way, that Jesus will be one who comes, and for those unprepared, it will be like someone breaking into your home while you were sleeping, a thief in the night, one who would bore through a wall, rob you blind while you sleep. But for the master who is unprepared and asleep, that's exactly what the return of the Son of Man will look like. Jesus concludes in verse 44 by saying, The Son of Man is coming at an hour you do not expect. The force of the original language here is a little bit more explicit. You could translate it that He will come at a time that you would not consider possible. If you could put money on the day that Christ would return, you would be wrong, is what He's getting at here. It's interesting as we think about those who make predictions about the end times. Well, Christ is pretty explicit about the nature of His return, and if your end times theology requires a calculator, Jesus says you're doing it wrong, because He will come at a day that you would not be able to calculate, a day that will surprise you. And because of that, many will be found sleeping, which is our second point for this morning, found sleeping. You know, it's interesting as we think about it, we as Christians are far more eager about Christ's return when things in our life are going poorly. I mean, in a lot of ways, this season of coronavirus has been an extended advent. I mean, there's kind of been a a communal uh, sigh and declaration, come Lord Jesus. You know, we, we can all agree with that. But I think the opposite is also true. When things are going well, we could just assume push off the coming of our Lord. I mean, what is the time in your life that you would least want Jesus to return? Perhaps you've had a vacation to Europe planned for years, and it's finally time to go to the airport and get on the plane, and Jesus comes back. (laughs) Dang it. Perhaps you were with child, and you were about to begin labor to finally meet your firstborn, and Jesus returns. Perhaps, like in the example of our text, you are about to give away your oldest daughter in marriage, or perhaps you yourself are about to be married, and before you head down the aisle, the return of the son of man. We often tend to think of wake-up calls as those going out to people in dire situations, but but the wake-up call from Jesus this morning goes out to those in really normal situations. Jesus talks about those being asleep as those going about their normal business, doing mundane things like eating or drinking or doing really wonderful things like being married or giving yourself or giving one in marriage. Not bad things. In fact, in the case of marriage, God ordained things, 
So why does Jesus use this as an example? Why does he use this phrase of marrying and giving in marriage as an example of being asleep? Well, for those who have been walking through Matthew or hearing Jesus' teaching, this phrase, marrying and giving in marriage, would be a bit of a trigger. In fact, if you have a Bible with cross-references in it, there might be a cross-reference here to Matthew 22, where Jesus uses this same phrase. And it's an, it's an interesting one because these words are not words that Jesus uses often. In fact, in the Gospel of Matthew, these are the only two times. Well, what's going on in Matthew 22? Well, the Sadducees, this, this group that does not believe in the resurrection of the flesh, come to Jesus trying to uh, trap him in poor theology and, and, and say to Jesus, so imagine this, Jesus, a man dies with no children, and his brother must marry the widow in order to raise offspring for a deceased brother. This would be a fairly common practice in order to honor the dead, to bring about offspring in their name. Well, they go on, well, the second brother dies too, and the third, the fourth, all the way to the seventh, never bringing about children. So Jesus, in this so-called resurrection, who will be married to the woman? For all seven brothers have, have been with her. And Jesus' response is this, you are wrong because you know neither the Scripture nor the power of God. For in the resurrection, they neither marry nor are given in marriage. Now, this passage has often caused people trouble. You mean the person that I have chosen to be with my entire life I won't be married to in heaven? That, that seems so sad. But even in that concern, we give away that we have a similar problem as the Sadducees. You see, Jesus is saying, listen, you're asking the wrong questions. You are so concerned about the order of this life that you miss the point of the world to come that it's a new project that is coming about. Yes, marriage is a good thing, but it's also provincial to this world. It certainly points to things of the next. But if your focus is on things of this world, you've totally missed the point of the resurrection, and you've totally missed the point of the world to come. Well, so was the days of Noah, when men and women are getting married, giving themselves, and married with no concern to what God is doing. So focused on this moment and what this world has to offer. Not only bad things, although in the days of Noah we know that plenty of bad things are going on as well. But here, Jesus saying, is saying that they are intoxicated by the cares of the present. It's a very similar thing that Jesus talks about in the next portrait of these two men working in a field, these two women grinding at the mill, doing seemingly innocuous tasks. What is interesting here is that those doing the same tasks, one is saved and one is not. Apparently, one of the two workers is consumed with the things of this life and the other is not. Luke's parallel account of this passage does help us understand this. He says this, watch yourselves, lest your hearts be weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and cares of this life, and that day comes upon you suddenly like a trap. It's interesting here, hearts being weighed down in drunkenness usually aren't things that that go together. Usually drunkenness helps with hearts being weighed down. But I don't think it's wine that Luke is talking about here. But the intoxicating nature of what this life has to offer. It can lull you to sleep by causing you to savor the present without any thought toward what is to come. In C.S. Lewis's the, the Screw Tape Letters, Uncle Screw Tape is writing to his nephew, this younger tempter who is being trained in the art of tempting humanity. And Uncle Screw Tape writes this. He says, You will say that these things are very small, 
And doubtless, like all, your, like all you young tempters, you are anxious to be able to report spectacular wickedness. But it does not matter how small the sins are, provided that their cumulative effect is to edge the man away from the light and out into the nothing. If you are asleep in the nothingness of this life, Drunk with the fleeting things of this world, Jesus' coming will be like a thief. He will ransack your house, and when he does, it will be too late. I think the irony of this season, and thinking about these things even now, is this might be the time, especially in our country, where there is more distractions than ever concerning the things that this world has to offer. But you'll notice here that it's not Jesus' desire for his hearer to be caught off guard, is it? No, he comes in kindness with a warning to wake up, to be ready, and to be watchful. And that's what I want to consider finally this morning as a call to wakefulness. A call to wakefulness. Perhaps you've seen the bumper sticker, uh, Jesus is coming, act busy. Um, I, I think that's often what we think about when we think of wakefulness, being prepared for Christ's return, that Christ is coming and we should be doing something important, particularly something very spiritual. I would suggest praying or fasting. That seems to be the kind of thing you'd want to do when Christ shows up. And though these things can be very good things, I'm, I'm not sure that busyness is what Jesus is getting at in this text. In fact, I would suggest, that especially in our own culture, we are far more drunk on busyness than any kind of good wine. I mean, think about your conversations this week, perhaps even today. How many times have you heard or said, we're just so busy? How often is that the thing that marks our lives? Perhaps busyness is exactly what we need to wake up from. I mean, it should be easy. We all hate how busy we are, right? Perhaps that discontent with the busyness of our lives and how full our lives are is a good place to begin this Advent season. I would argue that this is exactly what God is calling us to as Christians living in the already but not yet between His first coming and His final coming, that He calls us to be discontent with how things are. And this discontentment doesn't come merely by focusing on what is wrong with our lives. That we're actually pretty good at, right? We're pretty good at thinking about what is wrong, but if the antidote for what is wrong in our lives can be found in a store, then that's the wrong kind of discontent. God calls us to see this world as broken, to see this world in a place where it is not how He created it to be, to see people that are created in the image of God being unjustly treated, to seeing war and violence and that causing us a radical discontent that helps us to long for things beyond what this age can provide for us. And our Old Testament readings actually give a picture of a call to wakefulness in light of the world that we live in. They present us with a call to wakefulness in a very different way than what we often consider to be a wake-up call. Isaiah, for instance, in Isaiah 2, in the midst of prophetic judgment, speaking to the nations about what God is coming to do, coming to judge sin and bring about righteousness, gives this picture of the ultimate end. He says, in those latter days, the mountains of the house of the Lord will be established as the highest mountain, lifted up above all the hills, and the nations will flow to it. 
if you think about that picture, it actually doesn't make any sense. Things don't flow up mountains. And yet in this holy mountain, God will draw men to himself of all tongues and tribes and nations. And on this hill, Isaiah says, violence of this world will be no more. The swords used for bloodshed will be turned into plowshares. Spears used for warfare will be fashioned into gardening tools. No more shall nation rise against nation, Isaiah tells us. And he calls us, along with Judah, to walk in this light, to walk in the light of this vision, this vision of what God has in store for those who are ready, for those who love him and are called according to his purpose. The psalm that we sang this morning, Psalm 122, gives a very similar image of this house of the Lord where David's throne will reign forever, a place of peace, a place of security, not, not like this world, but a place where Christ reigns, a place where all the wrongs of our present age are made to right. God is calling us to wakefulness this morning by looking to our salvation and the consummation of it. The Apostle Paul, as he comments on this passage, says this, that the hour has come for you to wake from sleep. Why? Because salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. A proper Advent wakefulness comes, yes, by seeing the world as it, is, as it should be and, and, and the reality that it is not that way now, but also focusing on the promise of a salvation and a promise that when Christ comes, He will bring all things to right. A call to wakefulness is a call to faith. It's a call to believe that what God has said is true. God is not calling us to misery in this life, but He's also not calling us to satisfaction. He is calling us to a longing for His Son's second coming, to even see the good things that we experience now as merely a foretaste of what is to come, to not be satisfied. As C.S. Lewis also says, I find in myself a desire that no experience in this world can satisfy. The most probable explanation is that I was made for another world. And that is what Advent discontent leads us to, a desire for another world, a desire to be in a place where all things are made right where the sin that entangles us is finally put to death. To be awoke in this day, to place our focus on Christ's coming in a way that makes us so itch for that day that falling asleep would be impossible. This call to wake up should bring about a certain level of anxiety for those who are sleeping, those who have been lulled to sleep by what this world has to offer. But this anxiety is remedied in this season of Advent and always by renewed repentance, confessing our sins of intoxication, our sins of busyness, and receiving afresh the forgiveness that is found in Christ Jesus and allowing that confession and forgiveness, that word of the gospel, to be an alarm bell that wakes us from sleep. Those words that you are forgiven bring us to a place of wakefulness as we look to a place where we will not have to kneel in confession anymore, where God will make all things new. And for those who have been awakened by His Spirit this day, 
This passage is by no means a call to anxiety, but a call to a sense of discontentment with what this life has to offer and a longing for what should and will be when Christ returns. And even in this moment of the not yet, looking to our reality that is already true of us, the Apostle Paul tells us that even now our lives are hidden with Christ on high. And we need not fear, for when Christ, who is our life, appears like a thief in the night, we'll appear right along with him. The hour, the hour has come for you to wake from sleep, Paul says, for salvation is nearer to us now than when we first believed. Let's pray.